Good afternoon, everybody. We'll be making a start in about a minute or two. This is the bit, bit during a real seminar where we'd all be sort of shuffling to our seats with coffees and sort of patting people on the back. Um, <laughs> I feel like this is the, 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 bit, on the, it's like the <laughs> bit on the news broadcast at the end when everybody's shuffling papers, but you can't hear what they're saying. <laughs> well, they're smiling at each other and saying rhubarb, 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 aren't they? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Okay, um, right, I think that is a minute, so let's make a start. Um, so, good afternoon, I think it's just about good afternoon, um, and welcome to this webinar, which is again brought to you by Town Legal and Landmark Chambers. And today's session is all about permission in principle. I am joined once again by my brilliant and learned panel um, to help us understand what PIP actually is, the issues it raises, um, in its current form and what it might look like um, in its future. So um, let me move on to introductions to start with and without further ado. Um, for anybody that watched the classy webinar that we did, you might remember that I introduced each of them um, by reference to a well-known blog um, or webinar or podcast series um, that they have each become involved in during lockdown. But we've been in lockdown for, or some form of lockdown anyway, I'm not quite sure what the flavour is at the moment because I haven't checked the the news in the last hour to see what Boris has said it is today. But um, anyway, we've been in it for almost six months now. So I think all that's a bit old hat. Um, and I just need to cut to the chase. I mean, who watches webinars now anyway? Um, so starting with uh, Simon Ricketts, my brilliant fellow partner at Town Legal. Say hello, Simon. Or blood. Hello. <laughs> um, Duncan Field, another of my brilliant partners at Town Legal. Duncan. I'm glad you added that description. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then moving on to uh, my brilliant fellow lawyers that come in a barrister flavour, um, we have the masterful Heather Sargent. Hi, Mita. Uh, um, and last, um, but always far from least. Um, and Zach, have you got some beard back? Um, the fantastic and endless. A little bit. Um, Zach Simons, a little bit. <laughs> Mita, how are you? Oh, thank you. And to finish off introductions, I'm your chair. I'm Mita Kaur, and I'm a partner at Town Legal as well. Um, a few housekeeping points very briefly. Um, your microphones are automatically muted, so you don't need to adjust your own settings. Um, we, we very much welcome some questions and um, to the extent that we've got some time at the end, we will obviously try to get, them, uh, get to them as, as soon as we can and through as many as we can. And if you lose your connection at any point, you can just use the same link uh, that you used to get into originally to come back in and join us again. <coughs> Um, so, um, moving on to the actual um, seminar itself and PIP, so I thought maybe um, it would be useful if we started just by reminding ourselves um, of what PIP is all about really, I mean, in, in very, very brief summary, and I'm not going to go into any detail because I'm going to leave that to others, but um, permission in principle or PIP is essentially a route to achieving planning permission for housing led development, um, and it's the first part of a two stage process. Um, involving first securing permission in principle, clues in the name, um, which establishes whether in principle a site suitable to, for development. Um, and then the second stage is securing what's called a technical details consent, um, which is the stage at which you, um, which detailed proposals are assessed. Um, in terms of the legislation, um, it was brought to us by the Housing and Planning Act 2016, which introduced changes uh, into, the, uh, into the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, and this was followed by, um, let's see, the Town and Country Planning Brownfield Land Register Regulations 2017 um, and the uh, Town and Country Planning Commission in Principle Order 2017. So the government's aim with PIP um, appears to be to give some upfront certainty um, about the fundamental principle of development being acceptable before you actually have to go ahead as a developer or an applicant to work up detailed plans. And there are currently two routes available. Uh, one is by giving uh, local planning authorities the power to grant PIP 
to sites allocated on registers of brownfield land that they're now required to compile, required to compile. and the second um, is on application to a local planning authority. So why on earth are we looking at PIP? Uh, which frankly is a question that's been asked by anybody that has had to read the PIP order or the brand <laughs> whatsoever, because someone was definitely having a, a laugh at um, MHCLG when they wrote those. Um, well, th the answer to that question is really that last month, um, as we know, MHCLG published its consultation paper, Changes to the Current Planning System. Um, and amongst other things, that proposes an extension to the PIP regime as we know it at the moment, so sort of PIP level two. Um, and then also last month, um, for anyone in the planning and development world that was maybe hiding in a bunker in the Arctic somewhere um, uh, and maybe would have missed it. The government also published its um, planning white paper that we've been waiting for for a very, very long time. And this contains liberal, uh, a liberal sprinkling of references to further plans uh, to use PIP even more extensively. Although interestingly, it seems to be uh, used sort of interchangeably with um, references to outline planning commission, but more on that later. Um, those are obviously two very different things. So to help us understand this and to help us understand PIP um, generally as we know it, um, I'm going to turn to our very own nuts and bolts man, Zach. Um, to get <laughs> nuts and bolts. I like that. Thank you very much, Rita. Um, nuts and bolts. Okay. Um, you might think from reading the white paper uh, and all that stuff about growth areas that Heather will be touching on later, that there isn't much to choose between PIPs and outline planning permission. Well, think again. Here's just five minutes on the nuts and the bolts of the current PIP regime, and then others will come on to, to, to tell you more about what's being proposed to reform that regime by the government at the moment. First things first, they are definitively not outline planning permissions. I see that we've had a question about this already. Um, some of the differences between PIPs and outline planning permissions are really important and I'll come back to some of them in a few minutes but just to start at the very beginning to and to expand just a little on the story that Mita was telling you a couple of minutes ago about where all of this came from. The year 2016, the summer, some of you may remember the summer of 2016 was a busy time in the news but as I remember it anyway by far the biggest headline of all was when on almost his last day in the job before handing over to Sajid Javid, Secretary of State, Greg Clark brought in the Housing and Planning Act 2016, which among other tasks amends, as, uh, as Mita said, the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 to create what was then a new creature in the planning law framework in the UK, permissions in principle. And the next year, as Mita said, some secondary legislation plus some planning practice guidance was brought in to fill out the picture. And that legislation was amended again in 2018. Um, so that's where we go to find all the detail, such as it is on how this is all supposed to work. What was the idea behind PIPs? Well, uh, ours isn't the first government that's had concerns about speeding up the delivery of housing schemes. It's also not the first government to plan on introducing elements of a zonal system to deal with that problem. And the idea behind the PIP mechanism was all about speeding up the process uh, for developing housing led schemes by at least, this is the theory, getting the in principle matters agreed up front. Which in principle matters? Well, again, in theory, all the PIP is supposed to cover is location, uses which have to be mostly so multi housing but can cover other things too location uses and amount that's it location uses and the quantum of development everything else including and we'll come back to this dear is including conditions and certainly section 106 agreements come later at the technical details consent stage sound simple let's see uh, how do you get a pip at the moment, there are two ways, as Mita said. Now, the white paper might be proposing a third way with this idea about growth areas, but my, my job is to stick to the current system for now. So the first route to a PIP is to get your land allocated for a certain range, numerical range of homes in part two of a council's brownfield land register. Part two is the bit where the council's decided to allocate your land for residential development. And that's one way. Or you can make a PIP application. Now, what sort of schemes can achieve PIPs? Part of the answer to that question depends on the route by which you get your PIP, whether it's an allocation 
or an application. Now, if you're being allocated in the Brownfield Register, well, first thing so to state the obvious, your site's got to be Brownfield. It's got to be previously developed land as defined in the NPPF. Not the case for PIP applications, which can be on greenfield sites too. Um, and for the allocation in the, in the register, your site needs to be uh, suitable, it needs to be available, all of these terms are defined in the legislation. It needs to be achievable for residential development, which means it either needs to be allocated in a local development document, or it needs to be, in the council's opinion, appropriate for residential development, having regard to uh, adverse impacts on the environment and consultation responses that they've received. Now, what about the size of the scheme? Uh, under the allocation route, it, there's a minimum size. It's got to be at least a quarter of a hectare, your site, and it's got to be for at least five dwellings plus. But there's no upper limit under the allocation route. A different ball game for PIP applications, which can't be what's defined as major development, which is 10 units or up. So maximum of nine and a, a maximum of one hectare site area for PIP applications, which means at the moment anyway, that the use of PIP applications and that route is heavily con constrained and curtailed, which is, as Duncan will come back to, is something the government are thinking about changing and changing quite, quite significantly. What does your PIP application actually have to do? It's got to specify the minimum and maximum net number of dwellings, which are going to be in principle permitted. And for non-housing development that goes along with those dwellings, it's got to specify the scale of what that development is. Um, and the uses obviously to which it might be put. Now, other limitations, and these apply to both ways that you can achieve your PIP, um, it cannot cover schemes which comprise EIA development. So either schedule one of, uh, of the EIA regulations or schedule two schemes which have been positively screened. So the scre schemes for which you need to do a full EIA. And it cannot be on sites which are likely to have significant effects on European designated habitat sites either. What about the procedure for achieving PIPs? Well, the answer is it's quick. You get 14 days for publicity and for consultation too. Um, overall, a decision has to be taken on a PIP application within five weeks of a valid application being submitted. Life in the fast lane. Um, okay, you might think for PIP schemes of up to nine units, say, but what if that nine unit limit is increased? Again, something to which Duncan will um, return. And another point, no conditions, uh, so no parameters plans, no landscaping plans, no highways, access plans, no plans at all really, other than that red line and the indication of how many units can, can be fit within it. Standard duration of a PIP granted by a um, PIP application is three years and by an allocation is five years. Before your PIP goes pop, you'll need a technical details consent to get a planning permission which you can actually build. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, it, quite a bit really. It's everything necessary to enable your permission to be granted without reservation. So this is reserved matters. So we need full details of layout, scale, landscaping, appearance and, and access, which is all familiar stuff. But actually, it goes an awful lot further than a standard reserved matters application because remember, Unlike your outline application, your PIP's got no, and I've said this already, but no conditioned plans, no illustrative master plans, no section 106 agreement, uh, not much else. So your technical details consent starts from a pretty blank page, which means you'll often have an awful lot of work to do. And some of that work may be very contentious, may be difficult to convert your PIP into a full planning application, which you can actually get on and build. To round off this, headline nuts and bolts summary with just a couple of issues with the current regime that perhaps we'll delve into a bit more later. Um, the first is mission creep because albeit the idea of a PIP is to front load the big in principle decisions and leave all the details for later of course sometimes it's the detailed stuff which tells you whether or not the principle of a scheme is likely to be acceptable or not. And some councils seek detailed work or relatively detailed work on matters like ecology, uh, heritage, highways, landscape, etc., to support PIP applications, which can raise issues that one might think go rather beyond the limited scope of, of an in principle approval. Um, and the second issue I just wanted to sort of put on the table is uncertainty, because 
given the number and the scope of, of technical details that are going to need approval down the line, including, of course, the sometimes all important issue of affordable housing contributions, it may happen that at the detailed technical stage, matters emerge, which might make a scheme undeliverable as a result of any number of issues. Those I've talked about already, drainage, access, detailed layout. And given all of those uncertainties, it gives rise to a question, which is how much is a pit really worth on its own anyway? And in what circumstances would you prefer to have one over say, an outline planning permission? And given the, 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 the priority that the government's giving to PIP as a mechanism, both under its consultation to the changes to the current system that Duncan's going to be talking about later on, and in the planning white paper that Heather's coming back to, um, those are very important questions, I'd wager to say, but enough from me. Uh, but back to you, Mita. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Zach. Um, that's really useful. That sets the scene for where we are currently. Um, but um, moving on to Simon. Simon, you've been looking at the take up of PIP, um, sort of progress on brownfield land registers, generally sort of doing some data mining to see, um, you know, uh, to see where we are in terms of how it's actually happening on the ground and, and, um, and how popular it's proving, I suppose. Um, can I hand over to you to talk, to, to talk about that a little bit more? I think, in fact, we're getting some questions about that already. Okay, yeah, no, um, so sticking with the current system, uh, I just wanted to get a feel for, at how intensively it's been used and I don't have any figures I don't think there are any figures nationwide as to at the application uh, level how many applications have been made how many have been approved but obviously you can run uh, searches of appeal decisions which is what we've done um, and um, since the application route was made available in June 2018 um, by my reckoning there have been 55 uh, appeal decisions. They've all been written representations, as far as I'm concerned, uh, can make out, which is unsurprising, I suspect. Um, and the bad news is that only nine have been allowed. <laughs> so uh, that's not a great success rate. Uh, and I think it probably tells us something about the nature of the uh, regime, and perhaps it's not, it's not meeting people's expectations because as Zach has explained, the, the, the only information that, that, that um, can, can be, that, that is for determination is, is the location, the nature of the land use and the minimum and maximum amount of housing up, up to uh, nine units. And, um, and so we see time and again, the, um, the, application route being used you know, on, on appeal so as to um, be a sort of like touch process, uh, procedure for determining the acceptability in principle of a particular location um, for um, a small amount of housing and you know often um, edge of settlements, countryside locations, there's, a, there's an issue about the particular um, applicability of particular restrictive policies and time and time again um, these appeals are being dismissed um, because the schemes are, are felt to be inappropriate or contrary to policy and uh, I, I suppose the two, the two comments I would make are first of all I think appellants are really hamstrung because uh, the advice in the planning practice guidance is that um, uh, conditions shouldn't be uh, attached at permission in principle stage and it's inappropriate for section 106 agreements to be entered into at um, permission in principle stage so not only um, are you not able really to commit to mitigation which might usually overcome at outline permission stage um, concerns which the decision maker has as to um, the appropriateness of the scheme in say visual terms, transport terms, uh, uh, etc. But but it's very difficult to weigh uh, to have um, pol positive um, benefits coming through that you can commit to that can be taken into account in the uh, in the process. And and so for example, um, uh, if people are trying to um, bring forward a scheme relying on an exception sites policy in a plan. 
they've found that they can't that they, they can't commit to the scheme being affordable housing or to the particular tenure of housing that's being provided they, they can't take advantage of the fact that the scheme is going to be self-build and therefore perhaps taking advantage of positive policies about self-build so all these have been problems and this is worth focusing on because uh, when Duncan comes to explain the potential widening of the process these the, these issues are really going to come um, to the fore so um, but what I would say is that um, approached in the right way um, it is an extremely light touch way for um, achieving acceptance in principle of um, the appropriateness of a particular site for development without needing to invest in the additional work that will be needed uh, even at outline application stage so as a relatively you know limited cost all things being relative roll of the dice it's certainly something worth considering where your main um, uncertainty is as to whether the location of the site is um, in the first instance um, uh, 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 acceptable. I would also say that I suspect that this is um, more being used by smaller scale developers inevitably because of the scale of the scheme but also um, by um, landowners, by those who regard who don't need the cost certainty that comes with an outline planning permission where you basically know the um, likely you know the section 106 costs and the costs of the mitigation you're committing to by way of condition and the design that you're um, that's coming through um, with with your scheme so so those are all issues which really aren't put to bed at that permission in principle stage so that's what I was going to say about the um, application route and just very briefly on the part two of the brownfield land registers um, route um, again we don't really have good statistics um, CPRE um, produce um, data the last report I found was March uh, 2019 uh, as of February 2019 according to their work um, 10 local authorities had sites that were uh, on or proposed for inclusion in part two of their registers um, across 58 sites with capacity for 1,590 homes. Well, that's really low take up and reflects the fact that there's almost no real requirement on local authorities to seriously look at putting sites on um, part two. Um, so, so really we're seeing part two almost in the sidelines really not being used at all. We're seeing quite a lot of use of um, the application route, but as I say, with um, a pretty low um, um, success rate. I don't know if that sets the, sets, yeah. sets the scene ready for um, seeing how this might be expanded. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, um, Simon. So I think between you and Zach, you've set out, you know, what the, what the current situation is in terms of you know the process the procedure and then also um, you know how that's being used and how it's being taken up um, so I mean at, at the beginning I mentioned you know the government um, the government's consultation paper um, which sets out its proposals to um, extend the PIP regime so um, you know let's move on to that Duncan I think you're going to um, give some insight into that and some views on what the government proposals um, seem to say and whether you think that um, this is really going to be a point at which perhaps PIP might start coming into its own. Yes, thanks Amita. Um, <clears throat> well, I suppose the main change that the consultation proposes is uh, to remove the restriction that PIP cannot be used for major development. So that means immediately that the limits of 10 units that Zach spoke of earlier, and in fact, the limit for linked commercial development of a thousand square meters or that's quite significant because there's an interesting statistic in the consultation which indicates that 84 percent of significant because that's the threshold for application 
when you're breaking up actually. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you if you can hear me, but you're breaking up a little bit. Do you want, oh, the crackling stopped. Do you want to have another go? And I'll tell you. Sorry. Sorry, I think it's um, let's perhaps if we give it a minute and, and then um, and then possibly so, so and go through to my fixed link in that case. Shall I do that? Yeah, okay, yeah, good idea. All right, see you in a moment. Um, um, perhaps this is this is probably a good time actually to have a little bit of discussion around the existing uh, the existing system as we've just um, talked about it, um, Zach and uh, Simon, and we have had some we've had various questions yeah. um, that have come up. Um, some of them are sort of quite specific. I think one interesting point um, that I know we've talked about amongst ourselves and you in particular, Zach, um, is sort of the line between um, you know what are issues. Uh, of principle for the 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 um, pit part, if you like, and what are really details that need to be dealt with at the um, uh, the, the technical um, detail stage. Um, yeah. I don't have any views about that. I think that it's a really important question because the whole process relies on there being a distinction between the big in principle stuff and technical details which can all be can all be handled later but in reality when you try and drill down into and to trying to work out where those where those lines are it, it, we're not we're not we're not told um and and what's what makes it very difficult for those seeking to go through the application route is is that it's perfectly understandable why a local authority might want to see for example a worked out layout say or a, or, a, or an illustrative landscaping scheme something like that or have a bit more detail on something like ecology or heritage to try and understand at least at a broad level how a scheme might come forward at an illustrative level in a way which is acceptable well, totally understandable but then as i hinted at earlier on if you're starting as an applicant for planning permission to have to put in all the work to prepare these sort of detailed reports and all of that anyway we start to move away from the idea of a light touch process that simon was was, de was describing earlier and something more in the direction of an outline planning permission but without the benefits that Simon was talking about an outline planning application but without the ability to actually condition some of this stuff to enable you to actually achieve and rely on the benefits and that you that you're able to deliver so it's um it, it's perhaps not, not not an ideal balance for those seeking to rely on the application route thanks Zach um I think Duncan might might be in place to uh, try again. He obviously also has to wear a jacket if he sits in a different place in the office. I, um, so let's see. Uh, is that better? Oh yeah, I can hear you. Although you seem to be talking without moving your lips. There we go. Which we always knew you could do, obviously. <laughs> but uh, being triloquist um, <laughs> experience, is that better? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, no, that's definitely. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, the main change in the consultation white paper is the removal of the restriction that PIP uh, cannot be used for major development. So the limits of 10 units that Zach referred to earlier um, and the limits on linked commercial development, which is a thousand square meters or one hectare, completely disappear. Um, and that's quite significant um, for those who didn't hear during when I was breaking up. Um, there's an interesting statistic in the consultation paper which indicates that 84% of planning applications for residential development are between 10 and 150 homes. Um, and that 150 homes figure is significant because that's the, uh, that's the threshold for screening for EIA development in Schedule 2 to the EIA regulations which I'll come on to in a moment and together those planning applications deliver about 46 percent of new housing development each year so on the face of it that's quite a significant change um, the government identifies the fact that it expects it to assist small and medium-sized developers in particular who might have you know small urban sites where uh, density might allow them to go quite significantly above uh, 10 units um, and it's firmly set also in the context of the need to support economic recovery and 
housing delivery. So I think the government at least has significant expectations of what this uh, change could, could deliver. Um, I mentioned DIA earlier. There's no proposal to change the current position, which is that you cannot use permission in principle for EIA development. Um, and likewise, no change to the current position where you are unable to use permission in principle for development, which uh, is likely to have a significant effect on a European habitat. Um, but the fact that they're lifting the restriction on major development does give some potential headroom uh, for significant sites to come forward. Um, the timeframes at present are proposed to remain unchanged. So five weeks for determination, 14 days consultation. I think that's partly because the government wants it to remain an attractive proposition for uh, developers. There's also the same information requirements. So there's no hint that they might um, expand uh, those information requirements with one exception. And that is they've um, put out for feedback the possibility that they might introduce height parameters. Um, and the consultation paper itself concedes that that might be uh, yeah, not a practical uh, proposal because it would lead um, authorities down the line of requiring more design information and of course that's partly what PIF is supposed to avoid um, but other changes to process include wider publicity presumably because you know, there's a po possibility of bringing forward uh, bigger sites um, so not just the, the website uh, and not just the site notice which is the position at the moment um, and they're also, I think, alive to this issue of poor take up and uh, obsession with details um, on the part of well, probably applicants and local authorities. Um, and so they're suggesting a revised fee scale to try to incentivize the use, which will be generally uh, producing a lower fee outcome and differential rates per hectare, depending on the size of the site. So the bigger the site, the more you'll pay. Um, and uh, also promised the um, publish, publication of guidance, um, which uh, will be designed to encourage use. So in, in the consultation paper, they hint that they will, you know, they're interested in whether it would be uh, a good idea for them to draw out benefits more and to emphasize the importance of not requiring too much information at the permission in principle stage. Um, and, um, to uh, guide local authorities away from requiring um, more information uh, than is intended. Um, and uh, also to perhaps produce um, some kind of statistic for um, analysis on why this route should be more cost effective and involve less expenditure on the part of developers and landowners to, again, to encourage take up. So, you know, potentially quite a significant change. I don't think, um, the government is blind to some of the practical issues that both Zach and Simon have uh, raised. Uh, but at the same time, I think that, you know, there's no firm proposals for how to deal with that other than pro pro producing guidance um, and, you know, steering uh, people more down this route through incentivizing on fees and, um, uh, uh, and in terms of uh, the strong push for local authorities not to require further information. Um, I think part of the consultation response from people in the profession ought to be, you know, a, around how to make this work better. And, you know, perhaps we'll come on to talk about that. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, I mean, on some of the last points that you were talking about, sorry, I've got the paper in front of me, and I think, you know, one of the things that, um, the, the, the paragraph that I found quite interesting was um, around the proposal um, for additional guidance to support implementation, where it says that in particular it seems some local planning authorities continue to make decisions on PIP based on details ma detailed matters, such as transport access, when mm. they only be taking consideration at the TVC stage. Um, it's also not certain that developers appreciate the gains they can make in terms of savings on costs and assessment when ascertaining up front the suitability of a particular site um, for development. And interesting that they think the way of overcoming this is just providing more guidance when actually it's really just not that simple. Mm. Um, 
I think I think they'd be quite interested actually in the. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, one assumes they must have done it, but that analysis that Simon had around pins appeal decisions, I think, is is quite interesting because this clearly isn't just local authorities. Um, it's inspectors as well who are uh, struggling with the concept of PIP and how much detail can or cannot be required. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yes, again, it comes back to the sort of, you know, inherent tension, I think, um, like you were also um, sort of alluding to earlier. Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of the, in terms of the proposals, um, is this, is this really going to make a, a huge amount of, of difference or not is the question to um, the take up of PIP when we haven't overcome yet, um, you know, a number of these issues that all, you know, already exist um, and which from the proposals, it's not, in, it's not really evident that they're going to be overcome. Um, Zach, Simon and Heather, obviously, um, um, what do you think? I think the problems that we've all been discussing so far and that will continue to go on to some more of them, some of them that are being raised in the very interesting questions we're receiving, aren't, aren't answered by, the, by, by simply increasing the, um, the threshold of the number of units you can apply for. We've had a really interesting question, I think, about the green belt, pips in the green belt. You know, you, you, there's obviously there's no, there's no bar on. Um, applying for, um, for 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 a PIP on a green belt site, but how, as the local planning authority, the the, the questioner asks, can 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 we assess? She she says, um, you know, impact on openness and those sorts of questions, even at the high level of, in, of an in principle assessment, without some sort of you know illustrative scheme to look at. I think that's a really, really difficult question. Um, and another questioner asks, you know, what's what's the role of design what role does design play in the pip process and you know the legal answer is well it doesn't play one because because pip is restricted to use quantum and location but of course in the real world you know that it's perfectly understandable that that, that that depending on the scheme the authority might want to have an understanding of what of, of what's being proposed in terms of design these are very difficult um circles to square and i don't think that the uh, consultation that duncan's been explaining to us really Really, really answers these these very difficult problems. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. It's really difficult to see how you arrive at um, a piece of paper that's sort of bankable in a way that it get, takes you beyond having a firm uh, allocation in a local plan. Um, I mean, what, what, what more does it secure for you? Okay, we you know that a form of development uh, uh, it, it is acceptable, but the big questions are, are really out there as to um, the nature of the scheme that needs to come forward that is going to be acceptable, um, uh, the, 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 the cost of the, the access arrangements, what the Section 106 um, arrangements are going to need to be, affordable housing, um, other commitments. Um, so that's in in limited situations you can see that some sort of um commitment by the authority that goes beyond what is in the local plan may be um may be of worth but you know that's probably going to be a struggle as well yeah no, i agree it's this issue about what yeah ultimately what what is the point of it if 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 all it can tell you is that I don't know. Does it go beyond then? You know, go, go beyond anything in, the, in terms of the register. You know that this is suitable for housing-led development. Full stop. Um, whether you can then actually build any <laughs> um, is still a huge question mark. I mean, any at all in some cases. I would have thought, depending on the size of the site. Um, I, I wonder if this is a good point then to um, to look at the longer-term future of PIP. Um, so we mentioned that. Uh, the, the white paper proposes the use of PIP um, as a proposed route to permission um, in the context of this sort of reimagined new planning system, um, Brave New World, that we're going to, to have um, coming forward over the next few years, I guess. Um, and Heather, can I turn to you at this point um, to examine what the white paper says um, in a bit more detail about PIP and where it's sort of, you know, proposing that it may be used? Yeah, thanks, Mita. Um, this is, I think, possibly the part of this evening's uh, webinar where you might want to reach for a cold towel or a stiff drink, uh, depending on your preference if you're listening in. 
Um, the context, first of all, for thinking about the white paper, I think, is that when the 2016 Act was at bill stage, the government in its consultation document posed the question, how will PIP deliver the zonal system that it had promised in its productivity plan? And the answer given was that using locally produced plans and registers to grant PIP incorporates some of the essential characteristics seen in the zonal systems of other successful countries throughout Europe and beyond. Now, of course, to date, the zonal system hasn't yet been delivered. And whilst PIP is granted through brownfield registers, the ability to grant PIP through local plans or neighbourhood plans um, hasn't ever been switched on so far. But the starting point is that when PIP was introduced, the idea was that it would contribute towards delivery of the zonal system. And now the white paper, of course, is proposing a more zonal approach. But the position on PIP is not as straightforward as the government simply proposing to take the concept of PIP as we've come to know it in the last couple of years and applying it in a zonal system. Um, to be honest, as might be obvious from what I opened with, the approach taken in the white paper, I think, is rather confusing. The current PIP consultation, I think it's paragraph 90, makes it sound as though all that the government is proposing to do is to take PIP and to apply it to development in particular zones. So that says the white paper proposed that land allocated for substantive development in local plans, it says substantive, I think it means substantial, should be automatically granted a form of permission in principle so that the principle of development is established and subsequent consents only focus on detailed technical matters. And then the consultation paper acknowledges that the new framework will take time to implement, so hence why the government is keen, it says, to expand the PIP framework for housing-led development. But I think the reference there to a form of permission in principle is actually quite key, because when you look at the white paper in more detail, it's not actually clear that we are still talking about PIP as introduced originally in the 2016 Act. And the lack of clarity, I think, comes really from um, the introductory text within the white paper. So, as you'll know, local plans are proposed to be simplified so that land is either within a growth area, a renewal area, or a protected area. Growth areas are those that are said to be suitable for substantial development. And the first statement is that outline approval for development would be automatically secured for forms and types of development specified in the plan. So you might assume that the proposal then is to grant outline planning permission in growth areas. But then the next thing you come to, I think it's page 25, is with permission for the principle of development secured automatically in many cases, a major hurdle in the process will be removed, taking two to three years out of the process, at which point you think, oh, actually, hang on, we're talking about PIP, we're not talking about outline planning permission. But then a few pages later comes another reference to sites annotated in the local plan in growth areas having outline approval again for development. And then when you come on to um, the two alternative options that the government's proposing, um, one of which is to combine growth areas and renewal areas into one category, um, it's said that the idea there would be to extend permission in principle again to all land within that category. Um, and the second alternative is to limit automatic permission in principle to growth areas. So by that point in the document, I think you'd be forgiven for being at least slightly unsure as to what the proposal actually is. Happily, more detail is provided in the specific proposal that deals with this outline approval PIP idea for growth areas, which is proposal five on page 34 of the white paper. That says clearly and expressly that growth areas would automatically be granted outline planning permission for the principle of development. That would be conferred by the adoption of the local plan and then further details would be agreed and full permission achieved through streamlined and faster consent routes which focus on securing good design and addressing site specific technical issues. So, so far there's nothing that concretely suggests that the proposal is anything other than finally to switch on the ability for local plans to convert PIP as was intended back in 2016, except that the reference is to outline planning permission. And actually, it seems that simply carrying forward PIP is not what's proposed because the white paper goes on to explain that in growth areas, there will be three ways to secure your detailed planning permission. The first one given is what's referred to as a reformed reserved matters process. Of course, reserved matters is the concept associated with outline planning permission, not with PIP. 
The second way of getting your detailed consent is a local development order prepared by the local planning authority. Potentially it's set in parallel with the local plan and potentially linked to a master plan and to design codes. And then the third one is that for um, what's said to be exceptionally large sites, the government wants to explore whether it can use um, DCOs as an appropriate route to the detailed consent. So the proposed route is not simply that local plans will be able to grant PIP as stage one, followed by technical details consent as stage two, because amongst those proposed stage twos, none of them refer to technical details consent. And further evidence that we're not dealing with a continuation of the current PIP concept comes later on when the government explains that it's thinking of legislating to require a master plan and site specific code to be agreed as a condition of the permission in principle that's granted through the local plan. Um, and as we've explained earlier, you can't at the moment condition a PIP. So even if we are supposed to all be referring to this new proposed concept as PIP rather than as an outline planning permission, at the very least, the way in which PIP operates, where it's granted under a local plan, will it seems be different to how it operates at present. And weirdly, the final thing I noticed um, is that later on in the document, when there is what is clearly a reference to the current PIP regime, that's actually peculiarly capitalised with capital P's, um, which isn't the case where permission and principle crops of elsewhere in the document. So, I don't know if we're supposed to take that to mean that when permission in principle is found elsewhere in the document, that's not a reference to permission in principle as it's with us at the moment. So where does all this leave us trying to sort of summarise um, what's going on in the white paper? To me, I think, although there are references to outline planning permission, it's not to outline planning permission as we know it, because at the very least, the reserve matter stage is to be reformed. And additionally, as an alternative to reserve matters, the proposal is that you can get your detailed consent through a local development order prepared by the local planning authority, possibly, who knows, also through a DCO as a further alternative. But whilst there are references to PIP as well, it, it's not like PIP as we know it either, because stage two doesn't look like technical details consent that we're familiar with now, and also because it's proposed that it will be possible in future to condition PIP. So it looks to me as though a new approach is being proposed. I don't know whether that's uh, presumably it is intentional rather than inadvertent, but there's a new approach that's at least slightly different from the routes that are available at the moment. I think only time will tell whether it gets called outline planning permission or PIP or something else entirely um, if the proposal's taken forward. Um, I realise that this is the sort of point, almost definitely the sort of point that only lawyers get upset about, but given that both Outline Planning Permission and PIP are legally defined terms with a particular meaning in the legislation. I think it is unfortunate that they haven't been used with more precision in the white paper. Um, so I'm looking forward to some clarity on this because as Zach explained at the start, an application for Outline Planning Permission and an application for PIP are two very different beasts. So I don't think it would be appropriate to continue to conflate them in the way that they are in the white paper. Um, so anyway, that's my reading of the white paper. I'm interested to hear whether anyone else has read it in the same way or whether you've all interpreted it differently. Thanks, Heather. Um, I must admit, actually, it was only when I started um, sort of preparing for, for this webinar and going back in time and looking at um, <clears throat> looking at PIP and the um, Housing and Planning Bill that I realised that of that of course the Z word had, had, had turned up there. Um, you know, we've, we've all gotten very excited about it this time around with the white paper coming out and the constant references to, to zoning and what we saw coming out of policy exchange, etc. cetera, before, um, uh, before the white paper was issued. But, um, you know, it was already mentioned there and I, I genuinely, I mean, okay, I've got a fairly short memory, but um, I genuinely don't remember it causing quite as much excitement in quite the same way back then. Um, but. But yeah, but there we are. Um, I mean, one one thing, and I think this has popped up as a question um, in the Q and A, is actually, you know, there was this original intention to grant PIP um, for local plans, you know, through the through through the local plan, and that has never been has has never been followed through. And I don't think there was any point actually at which we, you know, it, it was ever pushed for, or, or basically everyone just sort of forgot about it. Duncan, I, know, I think this was something that you were you you'd sort of identified as well. Mm. Um, you know what what happened there because this seemed to be the most obvious way of taking 
um, the PIP, you know, the PIP regime forward um, in a way that would be most useful and, and I don't know, ha have some proper application. Yeah, I think what happened is I wrote a JPL article in 2017. The government read it and thought, "Crikey, we don't want to go there." But, <laughs> but the article, <laughs> but the article was actually uh, promoting the idea of using uh, PIP at local for local plan allocations and uh, drew on some Australian experience, which one of my colleagues had, who was with us in the planning team at the time. Um, and you know, I was, I thought it was a viable option to be honest um, yes there were you know clearly some hurdles to cross in terms of how you uh, assess environmental impacts at, at plan level with very specific site allocations um, and assessing the consequences of the you know the quantity of development that was prescribed for those sites but none of which I thought were insurmountable amount, I suspect you know if you if you play back what was going on back there with lo then with local plans and in fact probably is still going on with local plans you know there was a huge concern in government about delay um and in local plan adoption across the country and they may have simply thought that adding something like this in was just you know uh, uh likely to create even even more problems but I, I i felt that there was a way of creating you know a standalone dpd development plan document that could deal purely with PIPs across a local authorities area or even in just certain parts of the local authorities area which they'd identified for, wait for it, growth. Um, so I, I don't quite know why it wasn't taken forward if I'm honest. And it, in fact, I think the irony is that although the planning, you know, the planning for future white paper trumpets a lot of change and in fact, you know, does obviously introduce a lot of change, you know, sitting there, on the statute books is a mechanism to deliver one of the key uh, planks of the proposals, which is granting planning permission in, in principle through local plan allocation. Yeah. Um, thanks, Duncan. Um, just just going back to to where you finished, then I think, Andrew, um, which is perhaps just um, opening out <clears throat> the discussion about the proposals for PIP, um, whatever they might be, um, in in the white paper, and. And just generally, I suppose, alongside that, um, as you identified, Heather, the, the various different types of route to permission um, that seem to be described in, in the white paper, depending on which um, you know, type of area you're talking about. Um, I, I know, Heather, you said, you know, perhaps this, well, it's all, it's all not entirely clear. Um, but Zach, what's your, what's your view on it's really, really interesting because I totally agree with Heather that it's not clear what the white paper is really after in terms of the formal mechanism by which automatic permission will be granted in growth areas. Not clear whether that's what we think of as an outline permission, what we think of as a sort of reformed PIP or something, as Heather says, I think probably the answer is something, something new. And I'm sure there there will be those who say, well, does it really matter? <laughs> you know, does it matter? Because you know that we're, we're in for a new planning act anyway, so we can we can make up the new thing and we'll call it PIP or outline PIP or whatever, um, and we'll, we'll we'll make it work and consistent with the new zoning scheme. But I think as the discussion that we've had even up until now has demonstrated, it it it, it does it does because these are these are mechanisms that say outline planning permission versus PIP. Uh, to take two, 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 two examples. These, these are mechanisms that have really different implications, practically, legally, procedurally, all of it, um, as to how sites can be pursued and as to what you actually get at the end of the day. Um, uh, so, I mean, these, these differences might, as Heather said, be of lots of interest to lawyers, maybe more, 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 than, to, more than to others, but they're differences that do actually matter. I think what I'm not clear on, really, and haven't been persuaded by yet, is what the what the space is for the concept of PIP in our system just because it you know it doesn't seem to have been particularly popular there were I can't recall the exact figures but there's something in the original documentation around PIP whereby if you were successful with your application it would cost you a tiny bit more but if you know the cost the cost literally of losing a PIP application or you know and um, it's been an application as opposed to losing an outline application it was supposed to save you I think tens of thousands of pounds unless I've added a zero on accidentally but I just my suspicion is that in reality you're not 
unless you've done some assessment work around say viability affordable housing or you know whatever the issues may be on your particular site that it's a different thing it's one thing the government to say to you or you know theoretically there's this route whereby we can give you at least an in-principle support for your site but if you yourself have to invest in a lot of initial assessment work to know whether leaving aside whether you can get planning permission or not you know commercially are you going to want to try and make a go of it i just can't actually myself see really where, where the value is from pip and nothing in the new changes has particularly yet persuaded me otherwise and equally this having kind of been trying to understand and think through this potential third way again still not really still not really persuaded by it personally i mean sure others will have different views and i look forward to picking them up in the comments much of it comes down to probably the analysis of the government that at the moment there are three common stages you know allocation outline planning permission reserve matters approval each stage is has delays within it is you know paper heavy etc isn't there some way that you can bring that down to two 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 stages but but part of the problem is i think the reality is those three stages work as much for the market as uh, 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 as um did uh, they work for the market Be because um it you really need that outline planning permission stage at which you have certainty as to the map parameters of the development which are acceptable uh, and also the financial parameters by way of the section 106 agreement etc and it it may be different where we moved if we move to a system where um the the de what is required at the detailed stage is absolutely um foreseeable because of design coding etc and what is required by way of financial commitments is ab absolutely foreseeable because it's all turned into a, a sort of monetized infrastructure levy charge but i think that is pretty idealistic i'd be very surprised if we get to that so you do need a stage at which yes the principle of development is accepted but 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 also you you know you can carry out a um a, 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 an appraisal of a development you know appraisal for the scheme and uh, you can't do that i would have thought at a pip stage i think one really i completely agree with what simon's said and i think one really interesting uh, sort of uh, a hypothetical though it's going to be the sort of hypothetical that arises all over the country to try and test that is with reference to conservation areas we've had lots of questions in our and comments in our on the q a um already about conservation areas and about how an authority can sort of go about discharging its statutory functions in respect of um developments which might uh, you know impact or not harm the setting of a conservation area or the, or the conservation area itself and its historic interest and all the rest of it how how can the questions have been asked you know how are authorities supposed to go about doing that and undertaking all of that exercise um absent absent a bit more detail on things like you know at, at the very least layout or parameters or whatever very difficult but i think those same challenges um in, re in respect of designated areas like conservation areas or the same sort of analysis goes for the setting of listed buildings too those same sorts of challenges are going to be just the same sorts of challenges that that, that are that face us when it comes to designating growth areas through the new the new generation of local plans that heather's been been talking about in her in her talk um, because those sorts of very site specific scheme specific impacts um, are, are don't sit easily with the more sort of zonal approaches to, to, to that, that, that are proposed to be taken in in, in growth areas yeah, yeah i think that's right zach but also the the problem is that so many of those kind of constraints are enshrined in other pieces of legislation i mean i know in the white paper that you know it is finally proposed to do something about eia but as duncan said before you know the consultation at the moment is trying to find an interim measure that will help a bit and um, you know until these white paper changes come in if they do but everyone knows that will take time and so i think without cons i mean yeah without considering whether you also undertake fairly wholesale revisions to other parts of the planning legislation the environmental legislation then again that's another reason why i don't think this sits well in the current system that we're dealing with or indeed in you know even taking into account the changes that have come forward and been put on the table so far could i make a brief comment which is um about 
perhaps more positive about the, the way in which we might be able to use PIP um, if they're expanded as Duncan was explaining, which is uh, as part of a development strategy um, where, where, and this comes out of a number of the questions, um, we, you know, where it, there is controversy as to whether a location for development is acceptable, then to make an application for planet permission in principle, perhaps associated with or to be followed by an application for outline planning permission, not the way that the government sees the system working, I'm sure, but as part of a, an overall strategy to try to move yeah. forward with the scheme. Yeah, so I think that's right. I mean, I think one of the fundamental problems we have here is that when this was conceived, you know, the, the heavy emphasis of the reform was on brownfield land register and local plan allocation. It was not on applications. And so what, in a way, trying to, you know, turn uh, a reform or expand a reform for something it was never intended to, to do. And um, I mean, notwithstanding that, I think you're right, Sam, there is a scope to use it strategically um, in promoting sites. But I still, this is probably because I wrote the article in 2017, <laughs> but I still can't understand why, you know, if, if we're heading for this zonal system, why not, let's have a taste of it. Let's switch on the, the PIP for local plan allocation and see what happens and see what the practical issues turn out to be, because surely that will help us design the new system. Um, and in the meantime, if it works, then we've got more sites coming forward. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Um, on that note, um, I think our time is up, actually. Um, hopefully, we have hit a number of the questions. I feel that we have, having looked at the Q&A and some of the, the, the um, comments that were coming up in the chat, um, including the one about Duncan sounding better in a jacket. Um, I think we probably have addressed um, a good proportion of those. Hopefully, you um, watching feel that we have as well and that you have um, learned a bit more about PIP. So um, uh, on that note, can I just say thank you very much to my panel, Simon, Duncan, Heather, Zach, um, and thank you to all of you who tuned in. As I said, hopefully um, we've turned PIP round and round and upside down um, and given you, given you an idea of why, in our view, um, we should all be keeping an eye on it, certainly for the moment. Although, you know, obviously many more questions, many more issues um, to come in due course. Uh, before we finish, if you feel as though you can take another webinar, and obviously I didn't mean it when I said earlier who watches webinars these days anyway. Um, so another webinar, Jam Pack with Planning Lawyers. Um, please do join us on Wednesday, the 7th of October at 5.30 p.m. Simon, that is right, isn't it? Please not. Yes. <laughs> uh, when we'll be discussing the White Paper's proposed infrastructure levy regime, otherwise known as ill, um, with Simon Gamble. And on that note, it's definitely one o'clock. Good night. Good.